the, the Internet Caucus was created 20 years ago to help inform the debate and the discussion about key Internet policy questions. And of course, net neutrality is uh, towards the top of that list. Even though uh, all of us and all of our bosses may not agree on how to approach net neutrality, I think this, this case uh, is important for all of us. So I'm glad that we get a chance to hear from uh, various stakeholders and their views on how we should be thinking about these issues. Uh, net neutrality has been a top issue for my boss for many years. Uh, this case in particular is pretty important for us. She led an amicus brief uh, that was involved in the case with, that was signed by 100 members of Congress. Um, she, Mozilla, the lead plaintiff, is headquartered in our district, which we're always proud of. Uh, so is Santa Clara County, who was also party to the case. Um, and this year we did a couple of town halls with Commissioner Rosenworcel of the FCC uh, focused on net neutrality. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to hearing what all of you have to say, and I think others are too. Um, on behalf of the caucus, I want to thank the panelists and the moderator uh, for spending time with us and helping inform this debate. Uh, and I want to thank Tim and the Academy for helping uh, host and organize. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Caitlin, uh, who used to be a fellow at the Academy and is now at Brookings. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Assad, for the introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for attending our panel today. Um, and thank you to the Congressional Internet Caucus and the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy for co-hosting this panel. Um, my name is Caitlin Shin, and I'm looking forward to discussing the D.C. Circuit's decision last week regarding the FCC's 2018 Restoring Internet Freedom Order. I'm especially looking forward to discussing this case with our four panelists. So starting at my far right, we have Frost Van, who is the Internet Policy Manager for Mozilla. Matt Brill, who is a partner and global chair of the communications law practice at Latham & Watkins. Sarah Morris, who is the director of the Open Technology Institute at New America. And Christine Hackman, who is vice president of policy and advocacy at US Telecom. Our panelists are going to talk about the DC Circuit's decision in Mozilla versus FCC and what this case might mean for Congress, the states, and the parties involved. But first, I am going to briefly explain the background of this case. So in a nutshell, what is net neutrality and how did we get to where we are today? Although there isn't one universal definition of net neutrality, we can generally say that net neutrality is the principle that internet service providers, which are also known as ISPs or broadband providers, should manage all internet traffic in the same way and not speed up or slow down specific websites or applications and also not charge either consumers or websites different rates to use their network. The Federal Communications Commission has adopted three separate net neutrality orders over the past decade, so first in 2010, then in 2015, and finally in 2018. So in 2010, the FCC under Chairman Julius Janikowski approved the agency's first open internet order, specifically prohibiting fixed broadband providers from blocking or unreasonably discriminating against any lawful internet traffic. However, the 2010 open internet order was soon challenged in federal court. In Verizon versus FCC, the DC Circuit subsequently said that the FCC did not have the statutory authority to impose these anti-blocking and anti-discrimination rules. And the reason for this was because broadband providers were classified as information services at the time. So what does this mean? Well, the 1934 Communications Act, which was later amended by the 1996 Telecommunications Act, created this distinction between Title I information services, such as websites and applications, and Title II telecommunication services, such as landline telephone. Because the FCC had initially classified broadband providers as t Title I information services, the court said that the FCC did not have the authority to impose Title II regulations on them. The D.C. Circuit issued this ruling in 2014, and just one year later, the FCC, led by Chairman Tom Wheeler, passed a new rule, the 2015 Open Internet Order. The 2015 order did two things. It reestablished rules against internet traffic blocking and discrimination, this time for both fixed and mobile broadband internet, and it also reclassified ISPs from Title I to Title II services. Without going too in the weeds, this classification of broadband is significant because unlike Title I classification, Title II could also potentially enable the FCC to regulate practices that could be unrelated to net neutrality, such as broadband pricing, interconnection rates, and privacy, although the FCC could also potentially choose to forbear or abstain from these additional powers. So in 2016, the DC Circuit ruled on net neutrality again, but this time on the legality of the 2015 Open Internet Order. In a case titled U.S. Telecom versus FCC, the D.C. Circuit upheld Tom Wheeler's reclassification of broadband service as Title II telecommunication services, saying that if Congress didn't specify in statute how to classify broadband, then the FCC had some reasonable leeway to choose. 
In 2018, the FCC, this time under Chairman Ajit Pai, passed the 2018 Restoring Internet Freedom Order, which repealed the 2015 order and changed the classification of ISPs from Title II services back to Title I, which brings us here today. Um, about two months after the 2018 order came into effect, it was challenged in court, and in this case, Mozilla versus FCC, the DC Circuit, mostly upheld the FCC's 2018 order, but found issue with a few specific provisions. And with that, I'd like to turn over to our panelists. Um, first, I would just like to explore the court's decision a little bit further. So, um, and we can start with Matt. What did the court decide last Tuesday, and what does this mean? Thank you, Caitlin. <coughs> Uh, and thank you to the uh, caucus for having me here today. Just so everyone understands my background in this issue, I first worked on net neutrality when I served at the FCC from 2001 to 2005, when it was really an emerging issue and no one used the term net neutrality, but early concepts of non-discrimination, disclosure, um, were uh, emerging at that time. Uh, in private practice, in, in these proceedings before the FCC and before the DC Circuit, I represent NCTA, which is the Cable Industry Association. And I'm just going to provide a, a relatively brief summary of the D.C. Circuit's decision. For those who have seen it, it's 186 pages long, quite a lot of details, uh, but I'm only going to talk about every other page, so we'll, we'll get through this <laughs> quickly. Uh, so, so to begin with, uh, Caitlin mentioned the classification of broadband. That's really at the heart of a lot of these proceedings. There's been a longstanding uh, battle, really, over how best to classify broadband services, and the reason for that debate is that um, they have very different starting points. Title I information service classification really starts from a foundation of no regulation, where the FCC arguably can layer on top additional discrete rules for issues including net neutrality. Title II, in contrast, is from the 1934 Telecom Act designed for originally monopoly telephone services and has an incredibly broad array of regulations that apply by default with the FCC being able to cancel out some of those regulations through a forbearance process if it deems them inapplicable. So those very different starting points make it a very loaded decision. And the FCC in the 2018 order concluded, going back to its original determination, that broadband internet access should be treated as an information service, both because of its functions and because that would bring about a light touch framework that the FCC determined would, would best work in advancing its policy objectives. And the DC Circuit, upheld that classification. The court uh, relied on some of the technical analysis that the FCC did involving two particularly important functions known as DNS and caching. DNS is the domain name system and an internet service provider or third parties use DNS essentially to translate a, a URL that you type in like ESPN.com into a numerical IP address like 10.10.90.2. Um, and that's a critical function of internet service and uh, the FCC had found historically that DNS is, is an information processing function distinct from the transmission that occurs in broadband and that DNS function together with caching uh, are, are sufficiently integrated with transmission of broadband uh, data to make the entire service an information. And the DC Circuit upheld that conclusion uh, essentially holding that the Brand X decision in the Supreme Court controls uh, the DC Circuit's prior decision in the US telecom case upholding a telecom service classification essentially means that the FCC here can choose either label. It can make broadband a telecom service, it can make broadband an information service, but in the, in the view of the DC Circuit, that classification is committed to the agency's discretion. As long as it can explain its decision in a way that comports with both the statute and with its administrative law obligations under the Administrative Procedure Act. So turning to the APA, the Administrative Procedure Act, the court went through a long series of objections that the petitioners had lodged against the FCC's analysis. And by and large, it upheld the FCC's order against those critiques with the exception of three discrete issues that I'll get to. Um, in upholding the order in the main, the court concluded that the FCC's analysis of the effects of the classification decision on investment and innovation was sufficiently well-reasoned and explained to, uh, to comply with the Administrative Procedure Act. It also held that the FCC's analysis of the competitive landscape was valid and that the Commission uh, appropriately explained its backstop of relying on generally applicable consumer protection and antitrust laws from the FTC and the Department of Justice and State Attorneys General. Um, in contrast to those issues where the court upheld the commission, the court found three discrete issues 
where the FCC had not adequately explained its, its decision. Importantly, those faults led the court to conclude that further explanation by the agency was necessary on remand, but the court did not vacate the order. In other words, the court didn't think these errors were serious enough to undermine the order and to set it aside. It just requires the FCC to further explain um, these three issues. And, and the three issues where the court remanded were, um, first, the importance of public safety in this analysis. Some public safety officials, including Santa Clara, uh, argued that the FCC hadn't considered the implications of either its information service classification or its decision to get rid of certain common carrier mandates against blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization. Didn't consider how those could affect public safety. And so on remand, the FCC will have to consider those issues further and explain why its decision is not going to unduly threaten public safety interests. Uh, the Commission had argued during the oral argument that implicit in its analysis that getting rid of the prior rules was, was, a, was, a, um, was in the public interest generally and necessarily meant it was also consistent with public safety, but the court said there wasn't enough explicit discussion of public safety issues. The second issue that was remanded involves poll attachments. Poll attachment rights under the statute are granted under Section 224 to cable providers and telecom providers. But there's no explicit provision of poll attachment rights for standalone broadband providers as information service providers. And so the court directed the FCC to consider whether uh, the loss of poll attachment rights or rate protections for standalone broadband uh, providers was an issue um, that warrants further consideration. And lastly, um, the Lifeline program, which is the low income universal service program administered by the FCC, uh, the statute provides support as in most uh, of the, of the um, universal service programs directly for telecommunication services. And this was the case back before the 2015 order as well. And the FCC has historically said to, to be eligible for lifeline support, you have to provide a voice service. It later concluded under Title II that uh, standalone broadband could be eligible for broadband discounts under the lifeline program um, because if broadband is a telecom service, it fits within that statutory language. Now that broadband is, again, an information service, the FCC has to explain what does that mean for the lifeline program. There's no immediate impact on that program. Again, this is something the FCC needs to better explain and consider on remand. Uh, so after those decisions re regarding both the uh, classification and the elimination of what the FCC calls its conduct rules, the court had an extended discussion about preemption of state law. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more uh, as the panel goes on, and it's one of the more interesting and I think going to be more hotly debated aspects of, of this order. There are two types of preemption at issue, and just this very brief background. Express preemption exists where Congress or the agency in advance preclude the application of state law. So there are certain statutory provisions that do that directly and say a state may not regulate um, wireless rates, for example, in Section 332 of the Communications Act. Uh, there are other instances where the FCC has been given sufficient authority over uh, an issue that, that courts have found that the FCC on its own can expressly preempt. Here, the crux of the preemption analysis by the panel, uh, and this was a, a divided decision two to one with Judge Williams in dissent, was that, the, was that the commission did not identify sufficiently explicit regulatory authority to justify preempting state laws in advance categorically. And really the best way to understand this is the FCC concluded that because broadband isn't a Title II service, doesn't have substantive regulatory authority under Title II, doesn't fall within the other major substantive provisions of the Act, Title III and Title VI. Um, and the Commission also said that Section 706 of the 1996 Act, which had been invoked previously in the um, uh, 2010 and 2015 orders as a potential basis for authority. The FCC now said that isn't a basis for imposing regulations. It only guides the exercise of deregulatory functions and other existing powers. So in essence, the FCC said, we don't really have positive regulatory authority. And the court said, well, if that's the case, you also don't have the authority to, to preempt state law categorically in advance. Um, importantly, though, the, the court then said under the other kind of preemption, conflict preemption, um, it's premature to determine whether state law is or isn't preempted. It's going to depend on the specifics of any given state law. The way conflict preemption works 
It arises under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. The Supremacy Clause holds that where federal law and state law conflict, federal law trumps. That's the essence of our federal system. And the way the courts have applied that doctrine, there are two ways you can have a conflict under conflict preemption. One is where compliance with the federal law and the state law is literally impossible. State law requires you to do something and, uh, and federal law precludes you from doing something. It's impossible to comply with both and state law must yield, for example. The other type of conflict preemption is where state law creates an obstacle to achieving the federal policy, and that's often called obstacle preemption. And that's going to be the, the principal kind of, uh, of, of uh, preemption debated here. So if a state law, for example, says that broadband should be treated as a telecom service, should be subject to common carrier rules, should be subject to no blocking, no throttling, no paid partization, and other mandates, and federal law says the opposite of those things, I, I, and we can talk about this further, but uh, th there's going to be a strong basis for arguing that conflict preemption applies because state law and federal law cannot coexist where they contradict each other. So uh, Judge Williams dissented from that aspect of the opinion. He thought there was authority to preempt expressly, and he thought that the majority's analysis of express preemption might implicate its ability, the FCC's ability to invoke conflict preemption. So that's a, a pretty detailed summary. Uh, I'll stop there, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of that to discuss. Thanks, Matt. So um, it sounds like preemption is one of the bigger issues here, I think, especially since many states have already introduced legislation and California has even passed a law. Um, so this court said that the 2018 order cannot categorically preempt um, state net neutrality laws in advance. And, but should this give states the confidence to enact their own legislation? I can wait. I can jump in. I, I if I could back up just a little bit to um, qualify a, a couple of perspectives that um, I have on the order that I don't think are in directly conflict with anything that Matt said, but just a, a slightly different um, perspective on how one might view. Um, so I'm Sarah Morris, director of the Open Technology Institute. We have been parties to the case um, in Mozilla v. FCC. We were also interveners in support of the FCC's 2015 open internet rules. Um, long-standing advocates in the net neutrality net neutrality space um, and and um, were very active in both the underlying proceeding for the 2015 rules at the FCC as well as the proceeding um, to overturn those rules bring internet freedom um, so you know I, w I think it's helpful to maybe sort of think about what this decision means um, in a more practical sense. I mean, and, and essentially, to put it in layman's terms, what the court said was, um, th this is a Chevron deference case. Chevron deference is the, um, the doctrine that guides how much discretion an agency has to interpret the statute. And in this, this is sort of a classic uh, Chevron deference case where the, the court said, yes, commission, you were within the deference generally afforded to you. Though I will say the, the court went through great pain to say that that was just barely the case, um, and that this represents sort of the floor of, of what the agency can do, um, given the justifications that it made. And I also want to point out that, this, that the remand is quite significant here. This wasn't remanded on sort of three narrow procedural things. This was remanded because the, FCC, the court told the FCC that it failed to consider the implications of, as Matt pointed out, uh, public safety, lifeline, and poll attachment. Now, what does that mean as a practical matter? The FCC failed to consider the impact of its 2017 repeal on first responders and firefighters. It failed to consider the impact of that order on the one federal program that is capable of providing um, subsidies to overcome the most commonly identified barrier to broadband access cost. And it failed to consider the impact on pool attachments, which provides uh, competitive opportunities for access and build out. So the FCC failed to consider uh, public safety, uh, EMS and first responders, uh, broadband affordability, and broadband build out and access in its, um, in its repeal. And so I, wanna, I just don't want to understate the magnitude or the significance, really, of what the FCC has to do in reconsidering um, uh, the appropriate justifications and considerations for whatever it does with that remanded. We can talk about what's going to happen, what's likely to happen with, with this remand. Um, but going back to preemption, um, 
you know, I think it's really important to, to recognize that we've had lots of states passing laws um, uh, in the absence of FCC uh, engagement on net neutrality and, and, and indeed a complete abdication by the FCC of its responsibility in that space. And um, I think it's, you know, I've heard it say that, I've heard folks say that now the, this issue has been punted to the states and I would argue that the states have been really quite active for the last two years um, in establishing a clear track record of, of state by state engagement, culminating I, I think most notably in the California um, uh, net neutrality regime which um, argue is even stronger than the 2015 open air. So um, I think this does open up a lot of opportunities in the states um, and, and does provide some more clarity uh, and confidence for states who may have been worried about um, uh, you know, coming into, uh, about the, le the legitimacy of the FCC's asserted preemption. In the so we're um, at the Open Technology Institute um, excited to continue to engage with lawmakers to figure out, um, to help them understand the issue um, and to figure out what the best next step There we go. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in on the preemption point there. Hi, I'm Christine Hackman with US Telecom. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, going back to the preemption part, though, the thing with your broadband internet service is it is an interstate service. So that means it is national. When you think about your broadband connection, you're not thinking about broadband as something that you have exclusively in California or in Vermont, which is another state that has passed net neutrality laws. You want your broadband connection to be able to work across the country. You want to be able to know that you have a reliable broadband connection in California and then if you are traveling in Vermont. So I think the challenge that we're going to see is if states do see this as an invitation to go in and start legislating is that we are then going to end up with a patchwork of different net neutrality laws that are going to make it very difficult for consumers because um, you won't know what to expect from your broadband connection depending on where you might travel and I mean one of the examples we always hear about is if you hop on the Amtrak here in Washington DC and you stream a movie on Netflix going up to New York how many states do you go through if there's a different broadband um, regulations that you have to, that the providers have to comply with in each of those different states. It makes it very difficult. So when we look at the preemption, I think we have to keep that in mind that the patchwork will be very difficult and um, will not have any expectations for consumers to clearly rely on. And I also want to bring up the other point that Matt made. You know, what the court did here was just say no to blanket preemption. The commission can't go in there at the outset and just blanketly preempt any state laws that deal with broadband. The, uh, the court did make a distinction between the interstate and intrastate broadband. Now, not exactly sure what an intrastate broadband service might be. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a lawyer, not a technologist, so someone uh, might be able to correct me there. But I think we really need to look at um, the conflict preemption. And the court did indicate that if there was a specific law that did conflict with the federal policy of the light touch information service regulation, that that could um, be held to be in conflict and then struck down uh, under the supremacy clause, as Matt said. So a couple things worth noting. Uh, with regard to the patchwork, uh, I would point out that this is a patchwork that the internet service providers uh, invited by pushing for the repeal of the 2015 open internet orders, which was a federal regime. and. Um, uh, you know, th this is a product of uh, the the FCC's uh, deregulation in this space, and we have certainly seen consumer protection laws work on a state by state basis uh, at the state level. And so, the, the compliance issue, I, I think, is being fairly overstated. I do think that certainly this there will be lots of fights that will be happening at the state level, and that that um, will create a lot of of work to be done over the next few years as. Um, as states consider how they might take up the issue of, um, uh, of net neutrality um, in the absence of FCC uh, regulation. But I, I'm um, not convinced that, uh, that we will see sort of totally unworkable um, patchwork that. Oh, go ahead, Matt. No, please. No. No. So, so to take things back just a, a step from where we've ended up right now, the basic idea in terms of what we saw in the decision is this, this concept that a federal agency cannot regulate in an area where it does not have authority. And one of the things that you take away from um, 
the net neutrality repeal and the arguments the FCC has tried to push forward is the concept that the FCC does not believe that it has authority to regulate in this specific field. So the argument here is that because of the fact they don't have the, the ability to regulate in this field, because of the fact they have ceded that, they don't have the ability to preempt. Now, we've kind of talked a little bit about conflict preemption and express preemption and what that means. And Matt, is on, Matt explained this, right? The, on express preemption, the court found that the agency did not cite to proper authority, did not have the authority to preempt in that field. In the specific context of conflict preemption, which is where I think the battle is probably headed next at this point, the court did not, the general concept here is that conflict preemption is done on a case-by-case -case basis. Right? It isn't necessarily so much like the core is waiting. It's just like the actual formula itself for determining whether our conflict preemption does or does not exist is done on a case-by-case -case period when a state law is presented. Now, I think that we talked a little bit about the patchwork and what that could mean. I think the real benefit here for consumers long term is not only that we will get net neutrality protections on the state level, but that states will actually move farther and innovate and step in to fill the void in terms of protect consumers from some of the monopoly leverage that ISPs have in this field. Right? And so that could mean some of the things that Caitlin touched upon earlier in terms of rate regulation, local loop unbundling, and measures like that. Right? That, I think a lot of what the Title II battle has been about is what that actually means in terms of utility-based regulation. Um, and so, you know, all of this I think is going to be played on court moving forward, but I think the real benefit here for consumers is not merely that we will get net neutrality protections on the state level, but that states actually might move farther to provide consumers with the kind of protections that they need in terms of their relationship with their ISPs. So, so I'd love to react to a few points on that. I, I mean, I, I think that um, nobody disagrees that broadband is an interstate service. The FCC said so in its 2010 order, its 2015 order, its 2018 order. That's the one constant in all this, is it's an interstate service. And so preemption here is not like the traditional fights we had with telephone service, where there was a distinct local phone service and a distinct long distance service. And the fights in that context were where states have a clear role in regulating local service, do those regulations sometimes conflict with federal policy? And if they do, they have to yield. Here, there really is no role for, for states to play in regulating an interstate service. It's Congress's job to decide what, what is the framework for an interstate service. And, and I think um, the, the, the best evidence of this is that the, the 2015 order, the Title II order, I think it was paragraph 433, said that we can only have federal law when it comes to deciding this framework. The importance of that doesn't change if certain advocates don't like the content of the federal law. It's still a federal debate. It needs to be resolved by Congress, and this isn't a state issue. And as to the notion that the FCC somehow abdicated all authority here, that's, that's just not the case. What the, what the DC Circuit just ruled last week is that the FCC did have authority to classify broadband as an information service. It also had deregulatory portion of the communications, yeah. which, it, which is it, outside the jurisdiction largely of the FCC. It, it is. And, and, and the case law is very clear that when, when, a, when an agency deregulates or when an agency regulates, federal law needs to be given effect. And the, the FCC didn't just deregulate. It actually imposed a disclosure obligation under Section 257 of the Act which petitioners challenged as invalid, and the court upheld that as well. I, I forgot to mention that in my summary. What, what the debate was in, it, between Judge Williams and between the majority was timing. Can, can you preempt all state laws, regardless of their details, in advance? And the majority said, clearly, you cannot. But what the majority was quick to say, read from the opinion, if the commission can explain how a state practice actually undermines the 2018 order, then it can invoke conflict preemption. And it goes on to say that the preemptive effect of the regulatory choices the commission makes that are within its authority do have preemptive effect. So what we're going to see in individual cases, California and Vermont, those are two pending lawsuits that, that, that I'm involved in, is where the FCC has authority to classify, and the court said it does, where it had authority to, to rely on transparency, FTC backstop, antitrust backstop, those are affirmative regulatory choices. Can a state contradict those choices? I'm confident that the courts will say a state cannot, just as the 2015 order said, a state cannot contradict the policy choices of federal agency. Thank you. And I was just going to say, nobody really disagrees that consumers should not be able to access the content and, access and uh, services and applications of their choices. I mean, our members, our broadband providers want consumers to be able to predictably and reliably 
be able to access the online content that they want. Really where a lot of this debate is, is the classification status. That Title I, which the um, 2018 order restored, or the Title II, which was in place for only about two years. Prior to that, the internet really grew and flourished under the Title I framework, going back to Brand X and even before then with some of the um, policy statements coming out of the commission. So I think as we think about you know, the type of debate here, it's not um, no protections or, or you know, heavy or, or the heavy-handed protections. It's about the classification and being able to make sure that as we make sure consumers can still reliably and predictably access the services that they want, they have the protection, but we're also allowing the internet to continue to invest, and we're allowing networks to continue to innovate and doing all of those great um, innovations. You know, the internet that we have in 2019 is very different than the internet that we had in 2005 uh, when kind of this debate started, um, and Matt even alluded before then. So if you think about how much of that growth has happened under the light touch regulatory framework. So I think that's really the piece that most of this debate is centering around. Look, uh, just a couple small responses, and I'm sure there's lots more, I think, uh, obviously, what's next? For, for many of you all here, um, but you know, if we take internet service providers at their word that they have no intention of interfering with um, your ability as internet users to access the, in the content of their choosing, then the Amtrak example fails, right? Like if you're on Amtrak and everyone is committed to allowing you to access all of the content that you want, it shouldn't matter if the, the laws vary slightly um, when you're in Virginia versus in Pennsylvania, that the, the central obligations will remain the same and the internet will continue to function um, as we expect and as has historically, we, it is true that there has been um, uh, different approaches to the classification of broadband throughout the, the history of net neutrality, but the reality is, is that up until 2017, or 2018 when the, the, the repeal went into effect, there were clear um, enforceable net neutrality obligations on the books. The FCC was simply wrestling with the best authority, the best way to justify those regulations under um, underlying source of authority. Sometimes that was Title I, sometimes that was Title II, um, but what really changed in 27 was not simply a, a shift in classification, but rather a shift in the overall regime um, of, of how internet users are protected when they are trying to access content online. So all internet providers, by and large, have committed not to block traffic, not to throttle traffic, um, not to engage in, in other anti-competitive conduct. So as Sarah says, well, what are we worried about? Well, let me tell you what we're worried about. Um, the 2015 Title II rules embodied a completely <coughs> open-ended standard we call the Internet Conduct Standard, which essentially said, Something is illegal if the FCC declares it to be illegal. We're not going to tell you in advance what that is. And it was extremely frustrating to advise ISPs about you know, how they're going to comply with a standard like that when the FCC's 2015 order gave a few examples of, of conduct that was alleged to be inconsistent with the principles they were trying to effectuate. Zero rating is a common debate about whether wireless providers can provide certain content like video, Netflix, um, without it counting against a data cap. So if you have 20 gigabits a month, can they give you free data? Well, some advocates said that that would undermine neutrality principles, and others said, no, that's terrific for consumers. And when the FCC was put this question, they said, we don't know. We'll decide later. Well, the, the incredibly uncertain, debilitating effect of guidance like that is you can't invest and innovate. You can't roll out new plans. And the Amtrak example is, well, maybe you can do it in Delaware, but not Pennsylvania. So the reason these lawsuits exist in California and Vermont is because both of those states tried to reimpose this open-ended internet conduct standard. And we don't know what it means. So we can live with prohibitions against blocking and throttling, which nobody wants to do, and which my clients and Christine's members have called for federal legislation to enshrine. But we can't have an open-ended standard when it, when it provides no meaningful guidance and is only going to, in, in the end, impede investment and innovation. So as, a, as just an exercise as you leave the room today or as you're sitting in the room today, I would urge you to compare the open-ended general conduct standard with the FCC's description of the non-discrimination rule in the 2010 Open Internet Order. Um, and they're very similar. So what we see a lot of the time in this debate is uh, industry liking uh, open-ended standards and tests when they work for them, but hating them when um, 
you know, they they think that they they might be bound to them. On the on the zero rating example, the FCC very quickly came out with guidance on what which types of of um, zero rating schemes it would find most problematic. And uh, you know, to me, that was a function of a workable of of the workability of the FCC's approach in the twenty. Internet order. It said very clearly there are certain behaviors that are pro prohibited, um, but we retain the authority to ascertain um, whether new conduct in the future or whether certain uh, things that might fall outside of those bright line prohibitions might otherwise harm internet users' ability to access the content of their choosing. So it was a backstop um, for them to, to ma make sure that the FCC retained the authority not just to enforce those three bright line rules, but to ensure that there weren't any loopholes in those rules um, that would allow consumers to, and to give a, a forum for assessing um, new, new uh, prohibitions and behavior at the commission, which we don't have now. So really quickly, for those in the audience who are not so familiar with the concept of zero rating, it's when you use a specific service with your ISP or your mobile broadband provider, it doesn't not, and it doesn't count against your data cap, right? So that's the basic concept around zero rating itself. Now, we at Mozilla believe that zero rating is, is dangerous for innovation online, and here's why. And the FCC actually did some work, as Sarah alluded to on this. Right? So for example, AT&T had their own zero rating plan. And in order for an outside company to be able to qualify for this plan to have their data non, not count against the user's cap, it ended up costing them somewhere, I think, in the neighborhood of $16 to $47 a month. The program for AT&T, in terms of what they were offering to consumers, is $35. Right? So in the long term, this is not a sustainable model for small and medium-sized companies that are trying to compete with the vast assets that AT&T has. Right? So that is, that's what zero rating is. That's what we're concerned about. And that's why we need, I believe, a general conduct rule to kind of help companies who are smaller in the space move forward. It's not about Google or Netflix or Facebook, right? It's about the next companies that might come up through that vein. And that's really what's at the heart of the net neutrality decision for us here at Mozilla. So I, I happen to disagree on the zero rating issue about what's good for consumers, but I think the most important point I want to leave everyone here with is it doesn't really matter who's right. It, it, there has to be a clear answer to this at the federal level. Because again, if each state is not only defining its own internet conduct standard in open-ended terms, but then making enforcement decisions that vary, it is a recipe for chaos. If you're a wireless provider that's offering service nationally or even over a broad region, does whether you're violating this policy turn on whether the signal happens to go to a tower in this area in Virginia or in Maryland or in, in the district? That, that's no way to run a regulatory regime or to run industry. And so there need to be answers to these questions. There are sometimes difficult policy questions that can be fairly debated. But, they, but to me, the sort of nuances of that really underscore it needs to be addressed at the federal level. And the, and the FTC has taken up the mantle. The FTC has said, we will apply Section 5 of the FTC Act to decide whether broadband providers' representations are unfair or deceptive when they talk about things like unlimited plans. Mm -hmm. And they will also decide whether they're unfair substantively in, in violation of the antitrust law. So there is a cop on the beat, and the FTC has said they are happy to apply national standards in this area. Great, thanks. And I think I'm going to shift gears a little bit, um, and that was actually a great transition. So we're here on Capitol Hill today, and I would like to talk a little bit about Congress's role in this issue. So members of Congress um, in both parties have introduced multiple net neutrality bills over the past couple years, but none have passed both the House and the Senate yet. So could we talk a little bit more about this? What provisions are in the net neutrality bills that have already been introduced? Um, and is there a world where Congress might reach bipartisan consensus on a net neutrality bill? <laughs> no, I mean, our hope, our hope is sincerely that there will be bipartisan consensus on a modern, innovative framework that gives consumers the protections and gives clear lines of the road. I mean, this isn't just about broadband providers. This is also about the innovative services that we all want from our broadband connections as well. We want innovators to be able to, we know that data caps, um, or excuse me, sponsored data can be pro-consumer. So we want to make sure that um, 
there are opportunities to offer those services and plans that consumers want. Now, there are a lot of elements, again, in these both of these bills, having worked on some of them on the Hill and at the FCC, I think that there is a lot of overlap in terms of the types of the consumer protections that we want. We just don't want to have the heavy-handed rule or regulatory regime from 1934 that was put into place, I mean, 85 years ago. That's a really long time. Um, and to have those being applied to our modern innovative networks is just not the correct approach. There are, I think there are different ways that we can arrive. And so we are, we remain optimistic that Congress will get it over the goal line. So, I, you know, I think that the time is certainly ripe for Congress to take up this issue. Um, and indeed they have in earnest. Um, and, you know, I will say uh, uh, while the exact same piece of legislation has not been passed in both chambers yet. Um, two very similar uh, pieces of legislation with uh, I nearly identical um, objectives, the, the CRA, which passed the, um, the Senate seeking to overturn the 2017 uh, repeal, and the Save the Internet Net Act, uh, which, in, which passed the Senate with bipartisan support. Um, and the, uh, the Save the Internet Act, with, which passed the House. And so just, just to think about this in terms of, because I, I want to be, be careful when we talk about compromise, that we aren't trading away fundamental consumer protections or um, ignoring the vast amount of work that's already been done on this issue and has uh, been, been widely supported. So we have the 2015 Open Internet Order, um, which was uh, upheld in its uh, importance and validity from a legal standpoint by the DC Circuit, essentially twice by a panel and then again on banc, which means by the entire um, panel of judges at the DC Circuit. Um, that order was then, uh, the, the importance of that, so that represented this regulatory approach of three bright line rules, backstop commission authority, um, and uh, and that, was, uh, that approach was affirmed by the Senate when it, um, uh, decline it, when it uh, voted to undo the repeal uh, from 2017. It was affirmed by the House with a majority um, of folks through the Save the Internet Act, and it's underscored by vast public support uh, in the, uh, of the American people. Um, a poll by the University of Maryland found that 82% of Republicans, 90% of Democrats, and 85% of independents support the approach in the 2015 Open Internet Order. And those are polls that are replicated, maybe not with the exact same numbers every time, but the, the, the clear message that the, those uh, polls in total send is that the, the bipartisan majority of the public vastly um, supports uh, the 2015 Open Internet Rules approach. And so um, I, I, as we're moving forward in Congress, I think it's really important for everyone to remember um, the, the significant support that this has on a bipartisan basis, both in, uh, in Congress um, and, and certainly among the American people. Um, and so we will approach uh, uh, conversations on the Hill with uh, the 2015 open internet approach as, as the, the, the best practice for um, what uh, any further legislation should cover. And certainly the Save the Internet Act, which has already passed um, the House, uh, reflects that, that approach explicitly. So, if you want to be an optimist, it's easy to point out <laughs> there, there is a lot of consensus on the underlying policies here. I think everybody agrees that there should be net neutrality. Every ISP is committed to having net neutrality. So why is this so hard? Well, it's hard because we're fighting mostly about labels about Title I, Title II. It strikes me as odd that Congress, which is in charge of the FCC and in charge of the statute, should get hung up on debating which version of an FCC order to endorse. Congress doesn't need to endorse any FCC order. It can just write a law. And the law can enshrine consensus principles. I think we know what those principles are. There are no blocking, no throttling, some restriction or flat ban on paid partization. We can debate the details. Um, so, so there's a lot of consensus on what the law should be, and there's enormous support, I think, from industry, from consumers. Uh, I, I think um, we're never going to get there if, if, if we're sort of debating on, you know, the, the people want the 2015 order of the FCC. People don't necessarily know what that, that means. In my mind, what's really going on, and, and, and my, my friend here was, I think, acknowledging there's interest in using Title II for reasons having nothing 
to do with net neutrality, namely rate regulation and unbundling. And I'm, I'm, I appreciate your acknowledging that because sometimes people don't want to acknowledge that. If we want to talk about net neutrality, let's legislate net neutrality. But we don't need to sweep in a statute that will usher in rate regulation and totally unrelated types of regulation because that's not part of the net neutrality. So the thing about the 2015 Open Internet Order is that I think that there's like a law of like fight, Nick, you know, like we really need like a constructive conversation, we really need to like work towards a compromise. In a lot of ways, the 2015 open, open Internet Order was a compromise, right? It explicitly forbore from rate regulation and local Lupin bundling, right? We, like, this was something that was moved forward with the idea that we want to help take some of those concerns into account from the ISP side and also provide consumers with adequate protections moving forward. Now, Sarah's touched on this, but we have a version of net neutrality protections that has passed a Republican Senate during the CRA repeal, during the CRA vote last year, and we have a version of the Save the Internet Act that passed the House this year, right? And so, like, yes, there's lots of debate about what the final form of this legislation should look like, but we already have a good blueprint to work for. It's not just about, I think, the labels, right? I think it's about getting the details right. I think that in the 2015 Open Internet Order, we have a model for those details and how that should work in practice. Right? If the ISPs are concerned about you know, right regulation and things that they do not say see associated with net neutrality, okay, we have a consensus model, we have a way that we can like, work with them on this particular issue. But to be quite frank, like, if they, they fought against this issue, they fought against the consensus that was built. And that's why we, we are here where we are today. Well, just, just to say there was never a consensus on rate regulation. Because ISPs have steadfastly said, rate regulation is dangerous and inappropriate in this marketplace. And I think the reason there wasn't a consensus on that aspect of the 2015 order explains why it went to court. The FCC said we won't engage in what they call prescriptive rate making, meaning there'll be tariffing and the FCC will set rates in advance. But what it refused to do, and really the, the only reason that, that order was subject to appeal, was to, to regulate rates in response to complaints. It also said we forbear for now. And it's kind of like promising something with your fingers crossed behind your back. That didn't provide comfort to industry that we could invest with the certainty that the government wouldn't come in and then set different rates that would undermine your recovery. But that, that is the big fight, and if, if people are serious about taking rate regulation off the table, I think we could get to a resolution of this issue much more quickly. So if Congress just passed an amendment to the, 26, to, to the Communications Act that said no, regula no rate regulation on ISPs, then you would be okay with uh, the 2015 well, approach the, generally? I mean, The other major issue was the Internet Comics Standard, which is You just not said that that was the, basically the issue that ISP sued over in... Uh, yeah, there, were, there were two big ones. One of them was rate regulation, and the other, I just didn't want to repeat myself, was the Internet Comics Standard. But again, I think you have to think how we want to regulate these networks going forward. The internet really grew because it was regulated under the light touch regulation. Like, let's have a moment and compare, you know, some of the advances in telephone systems versus your internet. In a very short time, the internet was able to eclipse what we were able to do under the Title II regulation because it's permissionless innovation. But there is not, you know, it's not unbridled, as Matt mentioned. There is a transparency rule that is also coupled with uh, enforcement from the Federal Trade Communication, Federal Trade Commission, there we go, um, which has been the cop on the beat for this. So we need to make sure that, you know, we're not just going to be constraining um, future innovation and investment. What we saw during the two years that the net neutral, the 2015 open internet order was in fact, was that investment in broadband actually went down. And then once the 2017 order or the notice of proposed rulemaking was indicated um, that it was coming along, we saw investment shoot back up. So, you know, that's not the only thing that could have accounted for the investment in that time. Uh, the court made clear to note that uh, U.S. Telecom's prior reports have done that too. But it's definitely a strong indication that when you have heavy-handed regulation that will uh, impede investment and innovation. So I will say the one constant that has uh, fueled the prolific growth of the internet is the fundamental principle of non-discrimination and the ability to go where you want online without ISPs interfering with, with those decisions. And that, that principle um, in various forms has underscored how the internet works since uh, you know, its earliest days. And so I, you know, we can play the game, we can play, play the investment numbers out here. We have a, only a few minutes left. Remaining, um, I, and I would just point that, that lots of uh, research and analysis has been done that refutes the claim that there was this like dip in investments 
that aligns perfectly with uh, the period of time in which the 2015 open internet order was in effect. Um, but the reality is, is that the vast majority of the growth of the internet happened because, tight, because net neutrality was, uh, was something that the FCC had committed to across um, uh, Republican FCC chairs and, and Democratic FCC chairs um, since the 2005 uh, open internet principles. So. But let, let me just agree and disagree. I mean, yes, there's always been a commitment to these principles, but the debate is how do you enforce them? What is the role of government in doing so? When I was at the FCC under Chairman Michael Powell, he gave a speech that became well known as the Powell Four Freedoms. And he articulated really for the first time what net neutrality protection should look like. But in, in Chairman Powell's mind, these were market-based principles that providers would adhere to. And it was important that it, it en ended up enshrined in a policy statement that was not a binding set of rules, and, and even more importantly, it was not Title II. And was not held to be bound and grounded in a source of legitimate authority by the D.C. Circuit. But despite all that, the Internet <laughs> worked, we the the internet worked really, first. really well. So I think the point is, we're all agreeing the Internet has flourished. It has been this incredible engine of civic discourse and investment and entertainment and engagement and one of the if greatest the successes. If ISPs had not repeatedly sued to fight every stage of the FCC's attempts to impose net neutrality protections um, in the space, we would not be here today. Well, I don't know what that means we, other than the, we wouldn't. We would have had the 2010. We had the 2010 rules. ISP sued. We had the 2015 well, rules. ISP, ISP sued. sued. One ISP sued. But but the the, the <laughs> point I, I I would I would make. <laughs> that wasn't your client. It, it was not. The point I would make simply is for the most of the the history of the internet, which isn't all that old, but the vast majority of it, Title II has not been in place. It was in place from 2015 through the end of 2017. That's it. And yet the internet has been incredibly successful under a light touch regime. And Maybe the best proof of the pudding is after the repeal of the heavy-handed Title II order, there were all these doom and gloom predictions that the internet was going to stop, the internet was going to end, investment was going to was going to stop, everything, the, the sky was going to fall. Remarkably, our internet still works really well, and nothing has changed. So let's let's touch on that point. Unless Sarah, you want this one? All right. So let's touch on this really really quickly, right? This idea that like the internet's going to fall, it's going to stop, right? The idea here is that. We are theoretically like still like there's always a potential of future litigation on this, right? And because of that threat, because of the fear of potential litigation here, the ISPs have an incentive to be on their best behavior. That's one particular point, right? The second point is that the second point here is that we expect this, or at least I expect this, to move slowly, right? I expect like small things like zero rating that may not be like facially. Uh, offensive to consumers to move forward and then to like move slowly into more prohibitive forms uh, of ISB bad conduct, right? It's very, very difficult, or it can be very, very difficult to enforce, to create an effective enforcement regime when you're talking about monopoly bad actors. Right? And so I think that is really what the fear is in terms of why we have net neutrality protections in place and why it continues to keep important to keep fighting for those protections moving forward. Well, and, and importantly, we don't currently have a cop on the beat at the FCC to figure out where harms are occurring. So there may be lots of ba bad actors in the space that we just haven't surfaced quite yet because um, it, it has not, th there is no venue to air those, those types of complaints. And we have seen examples of, of problematic behavior that would have been the type of behavior that we would have wanted the FCC to assess. The, the uh, interference of, of firefighters' access in California during the California wildfires, we can debate, we can sit on this panel and debate till we turn blue whether or not that would have been a net neutrality violation. But the reality is we have no agency right now that is empowered to assess it. And we, so, so you what know. What about the FTC? Actually. That's a pretty big agency. But their scope yeah, so, is limited to, to uh, anti-competitive behavior, which is no, as, as or deceptive or unfair. So uh, they, they don't have rulemaking authority, right? They're only they only can act after the fact. But that's what we're debating is complaints. <laughs> Well, and let's, if a provider was engaging in anti-competitive prioritization or throttling, they would have to be transparent about that. And then there is sufficient, and the court did uh, find that the commission fully justified that there was sufficient competition in the broadband marketplace right now to be able to support the transparency. And then if a provider is engaging in those practices and not being transparent about it, then that is when the FTC would step in. But I will remind everyone, like, your broadband provider does not have 
have an incentive to throttle you. Their incentive is to be able to make sure that there's traffic on our networks, that they can be able to deliver the services and the products. So, you know, when we're looking at um, the competition, so the, the court did uphold that part of the argument for the competition and also with the investment analyses that were done, they found that there was substantial evidence to show that. So the commission fully justified its position. The court did uphold those portions of the order um, that do support the current, the, the current framework. So in the decision, the court, in, in the procurement decision, and it said that, there, that the court believes that they are going to defer to the agency's uh, judgment on competition, even when there are less than two providers in a given space. Um, you know, obviously, I, I appreciate that there's a lot of hard economic work to kind of to, to work for and try and justify that, but I think that kind of judgment defies common sense. Right, at least like you know, to have competition, you typically think you need at least two parties, right, to create like a market for a thing. Well, I, right? I, 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 Go ahead. I, I, I think that court said when there are two providers, not more than two. It, if I, it's less, less than two, I think, is actually that would be one. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> right, less than two providers. Yeah, but, I, don't, I don't think that's what the court said. I'll, I'll check again, but I believe it was, it was less than two. Um, great. And so we're going to turn. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to turn over to audience questions in a moment, but very quickly, I just wanted to ask if there are any um, next steps for consumer groups, internet companies, or broadband providers. Um, are there opportunities for appeal of this case? And if so, what might that look like and what might that timeline be? I suspect we're all gonna say we're still considering <laughs> our next steps, and, uh, but the, of the world of possible next steps, that includes a, re a petition for a, re a panel rehearing by the DC Circuit. Um, a petition for a rehearing on Bonk, meaning all of the judges at the DC, most of the judges at the DC Circuit, um, and uh, a petition for for cert at the the um, at the Supreme Court if folks think that there is a sufficiently ripe uh, um, uh, legal question for for the Supreme Court. Um, all of those are on sort of varying timelines, and it's important I think to note that any one party could uh, initiate. Uh, a petition for either rehearing or um, on bonk, or a petition for rehearing by the panel or on bonk, um, and any party, including an interview, um, uh, petition. Yeah, in terms of timelines, a rehearing petition is due November 15th. If nobody seeks rehearing, a cert petition would be due December 30th. But if there is rehearing, that kind of pushes back the timeline for seeking. Um, does anybody in the audience have any questions? Uh, yep, go ahead. Hi, Law 360. Um, President Trump made the kind of unusual step today of tweeting his support for the neutrality decision, and I thought that was unusual because he doesn't often personally lean into telecom policy issues. Would any of you like to respond to uh, his positive reaction to that decision? <laughs> Matt, you got feelings on this? You want to go? I didn't see the statement. Yeah. I, I, do, I do recall when President Obama, it was in November of uh, 2014, spoke out in favor of Title II, not just in favor of net neutrality, but the specific legal authority. So I guess there's precedent for elevating this to the presidential level. I'll just say that we hope that support for net neutrality can be a bipartisan issue. And, you know, obviously it's... it's uh, uh, obviously, I think that we have some work to do among Republicans to bring them on board, but moving forward, I, I think this is something that Democrats and Republicans can work on, uh, both here in Congress and hopefully in the executive branch. Can I go back to the list of what's next steps? Uh, the step in, in sure. Step. <laughs> I, I forgot one, which is that as these very, as we're watching to see uh, what, which things are, uh, where, where there are petitions for rehearing um, or for cert, uh, we shouldn't forget also that the FCC does have a remand on its plate now, and it does have to, it, it has been directed by the court to go back and reconsider its uh, 2017 orders effect on public safety, um, poll attachments, and lifeline program. And, and I think part of Congress's role can be in ensuring and holding the FCC accountable as it does that. And um, I think particularly pushing the FCC to answer for the uh, millions of public comments which uh, reports are now show, news reports are now showing were, were fraudulently directed by, um, with, with ties to Broadband for America and which populated the docket um, in which the commission has not fully answered for yet. Um, and I think we have time for just one more quick question. Question about the fact that we've gone back and forth and back in the past 
10 or so years. And I'm just wondering if this actually materially gives um, the ISP providers like the um, confidence that they have stability to invest. Is I, I can try to take that one and say unequivocally no. I mean, it, it, the, the problem with what is often called this ping pong match, Title I, Title II, Title I, Title II, is it's, it's debilitating for everybody involved. I don't think anybody wants or benefits from a, a constant toggling between different regimes. And, and that's why my clients and, and again, Christine's uh, members in the telecom industry really uniformly favor legislation to come up with a stable regime that's not going to be back and forth every few years and change with each administration. And I will just say that I will reiterate that the toggling has largely, almost exclusively been because of ISP lawsuits over previous iterations of net neutrality. Or, or their lawsuits, whichever you we, want to pick. We had <laughs> one lawsuit which resulted in the one um, order that was fully upheld by the DC Circuit. Um, thank you so much. I think that's all the time that we have today. So thank you very much to our panelists. Um, thank you to the Congressional Internet Caucus. And also thank you to our audience for coming today and exploring the complex legal and policy issues regarding net neutrality. So thank you.